Welcome to Off the Court, a show dedicated to making you the best version of yourself as a player and as a person. I'm Coach Jack, CEO and owner of Close the Gate Hoops. If you're trying to take your life and game to the next level, this is the podcast for you. Let's get it. What up? How you doing? Can you hear me? Yeah, I can. I'm doing good. How are you? Doing great, man. Doing great. Good to yeah, see you. I think it's working. This is a better start than it was uh, the last time we talked. Cool, cool. Yeah, I'm, I'm on. I'm on my iPad, so that's a little change. And then I got uh, obviously the new room, so awesome. Wi-Fi should be all good. Why don't you let the listeners know of off the court, kind of your story, um, and your background, and why you first decided to get into training, how you got into basketball in general, um, and elaborate from there. Sounds great. Yeah. So uh, I'm from Appleton, Wisconsin. Um, grew up around the game. Um, absolutely loved it. Um, I played baseball and basketball growing up. Those are kind of two sports and, um, those are the you know two sports I played in high school. And so, um, my dad was actually a high school baseball coach. So I kind of grew up around um, him and then definitely learned, you know, just overall coaching philosophies, you know, from him and, and being around his team. And, um, uh, baseball was just a little, little slower than I, I uh-huh. would like more or less. I mean, I still played it and I, I still enjoyed it, but you know, my heart was more, more in basketball and, um, I also felt, you know, maybe it's just the kind of the rigor of the game or, or you name it, but I, I felt like it kind of had broader, you know, horizons in terms of just like life skills. I, I felt like I built more life skills with that. And so, yeah, um, played, um, on the varsity team there for three years and, um, you know, loved it. It was, it was, it was my life and, um, you know, still lifelong friends with a lot of my teammates today. Um, but just like a lot of athletes and like a lot of the players I'm working with now, you know, kind of that junior year ish. Um, kind of ultimately made, uh, uh, you know, the decisions like, you know, do I, do I keep playing or do I look to, you know, play in college, you know, how are things going? And so, um, you know, kind of debated, you know, playing at a, a maybe a, a real small school, but ultimately just academically, I felt like just based on because I didn't know what I wanted to do. I felt like Madison, um, once I got in was kind of my best route there. And so, um, chose to go to UW Madison and, and had a great experience there, but, um, and I know we talked about this last time, but, but very shortly, um, kind of into my, my days in Madison, I'm like, I'm, I found this, this court kind of um, in the basement of, of one of their big rec facilities. And I was just working myself out. And it was a great, like, just, you know, stress relief from school and everything else. And, and like, I just, I, I love training. I love training. And it was like eight months into my college career doing this is like, okay, why, you know, why am I doing this? You know, is it to be the, the best intramural player ever? Or is it, uh-huh. you know, because you, you genuinely have, you know, extreme passion for this. And, and so, you know, that's where I really, really dove into training and dove into realizing like, you know, shoot, I maybe didn't train, you know, I trained hard, but I didn't train very smart in high school. Looking back, a lot of times it was just, you know, myself in the gym or, or my dad just rebounding and me shooting, you know, 500 spot shots or something like that. And so, and yeah, so, so from there, it, it, it kind of took off and, and it, it's hard being in college where, you know, you don't have a car or don't have. Um, things like that, but but I knew training was would be something that I'd, I'd like to pursue down the road. And so I finished my career. Um, it got kind of halfway through my, my senior year um, in college. Uh, COVID hit, and so I moved back home. And like a lot of people were just like, you know, what do I what do I do with my time? And so I thought, you know, that's a perfect opportunity where I had some connections still back at home. Um, and reached out and said, Hey, if there's any players who are looking to you know, get workouts in outside, um, the court that I grew up playing on my neighbors, a uh, little half, half court, you know, in, in their backyard, that's, that's kind of where I started doing some of my first sessions. And I think I told you this last time too, we, I, uh, the, the girls high school coach from, from my high school, um, their, their son is Joe or Joey LaChapelle and then Emily LaChapelle. I yep. uh, just committed to, to Marquette. And so I, those were kind of my first two clients. And so we'd be doing outdoor workouts. Um, and then also um, we would, we, we had this warehouse that we'd, you know, wheel in a, a hoop and uh, like basically just, just do training sessions in like a carpeted warehouse. And so I would say, if you've seen the, the episode of the office, it, it reminds me of the, the warehouse <laughs> On the basketball. Basement. Exactly. Yeah, That's awesome. exactly. So yeah, from there, I mean, just like, pretty much every training you, you start with one or two people and you know they tell two more people and, and yep. from there I've, I've really uh taken off and so I I, I did move back to Madison for for a, another job and and I knew that I wanted to continue training part-time and um ultimately that that job was um you know not not as fun as as basketball training so uh-huh. once I could kind of make it full-time I, I made that jump 
Yes. So you, you are full-time then right now, 100%, right? Yeah. Yep. I've been uh, full-time for a little bit over a year now. That's awesome. That is awesome. Um, so I actually wrote a couple things down. That's a great story that you have there. And the first thing I was going to write, so you were debating, so you became a basketball trainer in college, but you were debating it in high school. If I recall that correctly, or did um, you have no idea? No, I mean, I, I love like the training aspect. It was more so in college when I realized like very early in college where I was like, okay, I love this training thing. And at that point it was like, you know, what, what do I have to work for? I mean, you know, I was playing intramurals. My, one of my best friends was, was the club manager. So I played a couple of club tournaments and, but more or less it was, it was for fun. You know, it's, it's not like I was, you know, competing at a super high level. And so that's when I, you know, was hoping to, um, you know, keep, keep learning and, and ultimately kind of just took my whole college experience and COVID as, as just, you know, how much can I learn about training and, and, and how can I, you know, better myself to eventually better other athletes. Yes. And I think the, the best thing you talked about there um, during your story was um, training hard versus training smart. Cause I was the exact same way. All yeah. I cared about was working harder than the other person. It didn't matter what I was doing. As long as I was in the gym for a longer period of time, put in more work than the other person, I felt good about myself. You know what I mean? Right. And that's why I think trainers have become more and more valuable because people are starting to realize that like when you narrow down what you actually have to work on, um, you can drastically increase your skills in a much shorter period of time versus just relying on work ethic. And that goes with, with everything, right? You cannot just rely on work ethic. You have to be smart about which directions you're picking to improve yourself. But I thought that was your best point because I did the exact same thing in high school. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's super common. And just like you said, I mean, I mean, I think it's all about efficiency. I mean, we all have 24 hours in a day and and you're really, I mean, you're, you're probably working out for, you know, one to one to two of those. So uh, kind of the, the most you can maximize out of those, that short amount of time is, is key, like you said. Mm -hmm. um, so one question I have for you is kind of, so what did you do to, once you started to realize you wanted to become a basketball trainer, like you said, not just playing for intramurals, um, but what did you do yeah. to kind of learn about basketball training? Cause learning, even if you're not going to become a basketball trainer as a player, it's smart to kind of frame your mind that way, because that can start to improve efficiency, efficiency, like you were saying. One, yeah, 100%. And I, I think that's great for, for all players, um, to, to kind of think like a trainer and, to, and I'm trying to, you know, to be as open with, with the players I work with, just like you were saying, um, you know, so, so they see, you know, why, you know, why are we doing this or, mm -hmm. or why am I structuring it that way? Um, but yeah, I mean, ultimately I, I kind of just thought of it as almost like another class in college yeah. where it was like just strictly my own research. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there was a lot of, you know, big name trainers on, on you know, Instagram and, and things like that, where I, where I'd pull, you know, bits and pieces from them. Um, but also, you know, I think in, in every trainer's journey, it's, it's awesome to learn from other people, but also there's that point. It's like, you got to be you too. So it's like, I, and I, I still kind of toe that line. It's like, okay, you know, I want to take bits and pieces from everyone and, you know, what I like and dislike and, and learn from them. But also, um, you know, there's something to be said about just, you know, you know, you, you know, being creative as well as, um, you know, one thing I've been doing a lot recently is just like working myself out and just trying to like, you know, go through various game situations and make myself make mistakes. Um, and I found that that's really enhanced my creativity in terms of planning sessions. Um, but yeah, and I know that's kind of a broad answer, but besides just like putting in the time, in, you know, watching film and learning from other trainers, um, I did kind of have the opportunity once I decided like, okay, I'm going to start working with players. Um, I really wanted to just shadow as many trainers as I could. So I, I shadowed and, and got to know a bunch of trainers in the Appleton area. And then also was extremely lucky to um, meet Reed Osi, And he's been a phenomenal mentor of mine. He's a, a trainer in Minneapolis. I mean, the the very first time I, I met him, uh, two seconds later, in Watts, Andrew Wiggins, and I'm really helping out. Yeah, I'm, I'm helping out a session with with Wiggins, and so um, that was that was just a phenomenal experience. And you know, we still talk, at, you know, monthly to this day, and and he's helped me, uh, you know, from everywhere in terms of you know the the player development side on the court as well as you know some of the business side because pretty soon you realize, you know, you you can be a great trainer, but then it's like, okay, how do I actually make this? you know, doable if, you know, if this is what you're looking to do. So, 
No, that's, that is absolutely awesome advice. So the biggest things I took away from that were one connections, like you said, getting to know other trainers is really smart, not just to take away what you learn from them, but also, you know, doors that they could open for you. Um, right. So I thought that was an awesome point. And then the other thing I took away from that, um, your aspect of people always talk about if you're not first, you're last, right? And I kind of see the flip side of that. When you're later to the game, you can get perspectives from everybody. And then, like you said, kind of build your own version of you, right? Um, instead of being so one-sided to start, I think that's a, a huge advantage when trainers kind of have perspectives and use all these different angles to create their own opinion, right? And because and, everyone everyone's going to train differently, even though it seems the same. Um, cause like you said, it's going to have their own spin of, you know, you version. That's also a good way to piggyback into, um, basketball training methods. So do you want to kind of talk about what you think is the most efficient, um, way for players to train in terms of improving their game? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. And it is, it's hard because it's so broad and yes. everyone has, has different philosophies there, but, um, yeah, I mean, I, I think there's just a few really universal skills that, that every player should have. And so a lot of times I'll start with those, um, you know, especially with some of the, the younger players. Um, so, so one of the things that, that I really focus on is footwork. Um, I think just having elite footwork is just going to unlock, you know, every part um, of your game, more or less, you know, can you get to spots with, without traveling at the rim, um, you know, mid-range and, and into your jump shot. So that's that's one really big thing I focus on. And, and I mean, the same can be said with, with ball handling. I mean, if you're if you're a better ball handler, that's going to improve your pickups and your shot and, and things like that. So um, like one of the big things that, that I focus on really early on in sessions is, is just like the drop footwork or, or being able to play out of a split stance. Um, I think a lot of players, you know, one play with their feet parallel or play, you know, super narrow where yep. um, it doesn't allow them to, you know, get to angles um, and ultimately, you know, be as, as efficient with their feet and as quick as they can be. Um, so that's that's, you know, really one thing I focus on. Um, you know, for more of the, the um, elite players that I work with, I mean, that's more so Drew Hanlon uses the phrase trim the fat. And I think that's like such a good um, analogy where it's like, OK, um, you know, a good varsity player, you know, we're maybe getting in two to three sessions a week, which just like we were talking about earlier, it's, it's not that much time. So instead mm -hmm. of focusing on 40 things, um, you know, let's focus on one to two things this offseason that we want to get really, really good at. Um, and, and so that's kind of the approach that I take with, with, with more of the, the higher level players. Yeah, I think that's super smart. And that's something I've been kind of embracing myself lately is embracing slow growth. Cause I used to always be like efficiency, efficiency, maximize everything. Right. Um, but if you just em embrace that slow growth from day to day, it feels like you're not getting any results, but you'll look back in months and years and you're like, dang, that, that did a lot for me. Um, mm -hmm. so I totally agree with you in terms of that trim the fat analogy personally, for, and I talked a little bit about this last time, but I totally agree with your footwork being the most important. I would probably rank shooting, in my opinion, higher just because if you can't shoot, you are so limited with all the right. other things in basketball. Um, but then I would agree with you, footwork's definitely the next thing, just because um, handles and finishing kind of tie into, obviously they're their own separate things, but tie into footwork right. in itself and then defense. And that's kind of how we run our camps around or normally around those three subjects. Um, and then obviously we have more, we go into more detail, like, you know, ball handling, touch around the rim, things of that nature. Um, but I totally agree with you in terms of footwork. And I like that you talked about wide and narrow. That is the number one difference between girls, girls and youth players and guys basketball is girls play very narrow. And mm -hmm. what happens with this is when you're not wide, one, you can into get, get into good, really good shin angles in terms of exploding past your defender. And when you're thin, right, right your, your shin angles creating a way to go through the defense when they're right in front of you. But when we get really wide, we can get outside and around defender's hips. Um, but I totally agree. Like, that's the biggest thing with footwork is being able to be wide and explosive out of those positions. Yeah, no, exactly. I, I couldn't agree more. I, I usually have players like, like if, if they're just getting in their drop stance and it's super narrow, it's like, okay, like try to cross over with your feet, you know, almost stacked on top of each other. I mean, you, mm -hmm. you have no, no shift to your game. It just really allows you to, to shift your weight. And I, and I think that's awesome. I, I also love how you prioritize shooting. I, I totally agree that it's the most important skill. Um, the reason why I don't say that I work on it the most is because I try to be it like, like, just like we talked about with the openness with our players, there's a lot of players that come to me just for the skill work. So mm -hmm. it's like, and, and I'll ask them, it's like, you know, Hey, how, how many times a week do you shoot? 
if it's zero, like, okay, let's definitely get a ton of shots up here because you, you know, you need those reps. But if, if you're shooting on the shooting machine, you know, four times a week at your high school and then coming to me on top of it, okay, we're not doing any spot shots. You're doing that on your own. Um, so that's definitely one like transformation that I've made, um, you know, just from, from day one to now is just like be open, learn the most amount you can. And, and I think then you can, you can definitely like just provide the most value in that sense. I totally agree. Cause I, I always tell my kids, I'm like, I am not going to repeat a lot of things because everything I show you, I expect you to do outside of this. And then we can continue, continue to stack skills, right? Because there's no point in you coming to me. And like, we talked about this earlier, block training, like shooting 50 shots from this spot and then the next spot right. and then the next spot. Like that does nothing for the kid. Cause they can do that on their own time when find their parents to rebound for them. Right. The, exactly. the purpose of them coming to you is to learn and build new skills that they wouldn't have been able to do if they didn't come to you. Um, so I totally agree with that statement in terms of what you were saying. Yeah, that's so well put. I, I always just say like, uh, I'm not a shooting machine. <laughs> you, uh -huh. you can find those elsewhere. It's like, exactly. I, I mean, and yeah, I mean, and not to say that I don't work shooting. I mean, there's been a lot of like shot transformations that I have, have worked on with players and something that I feel a, a lot more confident now as well. But, but yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, we're, we're, we're trainers, not rebounders. Yeah. That's awesome point. You, you have written down here structured versus unstructured plans. Do you kind of want to elaborate on that a little bit? Yeah. I mean, I think it, I think it really relates to the block versus variable training, like you said. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of it has to do just kind of how I, I plan sessions. And, and I'd be curious to hear how you go about planning your sessions. I mean, I know a lot of it depends on just how many people are in the group, if, if it's an individual, um, all that stuff. Um, and I've been doing more and more group sessions, but I, I definitely really started off with a ton of individual and, and two person sessions. Um, you know, so for me, like my very first sessions, I remember coming in, I had had like a note card in my pocket and I still do that a lot where I'll just, I'll write down, you know, the three, four bullet points that I really want to focus on in that session, you know, but I used to almost like script everything and, and, and like very, very quickly you realize, okay, like maybe it's time-based or maybe, you yeah. know, like pretty soon you're off the script, but, but you, I mean, I realized that a lot of times that's better, you know, that that's good. Mm -hmm. And so now what, what I kind of do is I'll, I'll take those bullet points and, and make sure we focus on those. So for instance, maybe we're just working like a punch drag, like the other day I worked, you know, solely a punch drag with someone. So, so that part's structured, but ultimately kind of what they, uh, you know, the different finishes and the different, uh, you know, maybe we're angling out to a pull up or maybe we're crossing over and finishing at the rim, you know, that type of thing. Um, you can kind of vary the levels of, of structure with, you know, within the plan. And so, that's one, one big thing I, I, you know, have gotten better at. And I, and I think having, you know, a, a deliberate structured plan that's focused on their development, um, that's, you know, different than, you know, Johnny, the sixth grader coming in versus, you know, Gavin, the 11th grader kind of falls into the um, blocked first, first variable training as well. Yeah. So that's awesome. So in terms of how I do it, I, so we have a curriculum where it's based around nine core skills and it's kind of like what right. we were talking about earlier. It's more than just footwork and shooting. Right. Um, but we base that around, I call it red, yellow, and green. So red would be, you know, a really, really young player. He's just starting yellow is kind of in the middle and then greens like high school players that you can do a ton of different things with. And so I categorize, you know, what we can do with the core skills, you go to the main skill and then you go to the micro skill and then you go how to teach it. Right. And then you categorize them by color. So then, cause Obviously, how you teach, uh, you know, an outside outside layup could be completely different from a person that's seven years old versus a person that's 15. Right. So that's why I like to color them, because then, you know, it's, it's the same skill, but you have to teach it differently based on what how old they are. And then in terms of how we structure the workouts, we love to do themes. So obviously, whatever this group or individual workout that we're doing, whatever they need most as a player will theme the workout around that. And then all the skills we do within the workout is based off that theme. And I agree with you. Like you cannot script workouts. You can have like broad structured time slots, which we kind of do, but it's very right. flexible kind of depending on, you know, if they're really struggling with this skill, we might take half the workout to do that. It kind of just, we play it by ear, but we, we have a base structure in terms of, you know, warm up, whatever we're trying to focus on for our theme. Like if our theme's physicality, our, our ball handling, our finishing, our shooting, it's all based around that theme. Um, and I think that's helped us the most because it, it narrows down whatever our kids need most, which has seen the best results versus doing 
say you do ball handling that's focused on a split drop, but there's no physicality or contact whatsoever. And then you go into finishing and it's all physicality, right? So that's why I think it's easier for kids to understand themes better and learn more from them versus when it's kind of scattered on different aspects. 100%. I, I love that. That's, I mean, I think, I think there's a lot of similarities w- within like what I was describing, what you were describing, but I yes. love the the red, yellow, green within that as well. And and yeah, like I, I think kind of the, the bullet points I was describing would be essentially kind of like the themes. Um, but I, I do like, I love how, you know, people always say, you know, I want to get better, you know, with contact. Okay, you know, do you mean, you mean ball handling? Do you mean finishing? Do you mm-hmm. mean, you know, do you mean, you know, there's a, there's a lot of different aspects and I love that. That's, yeah, that's a great way to structure it in terms of, all right, if we're, if we're going through contact, everything today, we're, we're going to be, we're going to yeah. be going physical. Yeah. And it's crazy how detailed you can get. Cause I've been literally working on this curriculum for dang near two years and I'm still not done. Uh, nice. But that's, that's kind of crazy how detailed things can get. But once right. you have, you know, your curriculum built, it's much easier to teach it to others. Like you were saying on our last call, you have a couple of people working for you now. Um, but that's why it's so important to keep that same value. Cause you don't want, you know, someone that's working for you to be teaching a skill differently than you would teach it detailed and not thinking that you're not like always going to as much detail as possible. And if you think you're being too detailed, um, you probably aren't in terms of being right. able to teach it to somebody else. Uh, but I totally agree with you. And then in terms of for the listeners, block training versus variable training, we've mentioned it, but we haven't explained it yet. Block training is like when your brain is pre-planning movement and you do the same movement over and over again. So if I catch the ball at the free throw line to shoot mid-range jumpers and I shoot 50 of them left, right, every single time, my brain is pre-planning my movement and it's, uh, it's a consistent muscle memory. And this is great if you're trying to work on new shot form or you're just starting basketball, block training is absolutely amazing to build skill. Um, but it's been statistically proven that variable gets you better in the game because when we're in a game, we're making a move on a defender. I'm not thinking to myself, all right, I'm going to cross over left to right to get my defender. You kind of just read what they're doing and then you respond um, instinctively, right? So we're not pre-planning any movement with variable training. Um, and that's why the older, the, all my older kids and even myself, I've learned that I'm going to get way better when things are audio, visual, and just actual defense in front of you work. Um, because then your body has to respond to it. It's not something you're telling your brain to do, but that's what we mean listeners when we're talking about block versus variable, but that's, that's awesome that, um, you were mentioning that you do some of that stuff, which is really cool. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's great. And yeah, I mean, I think, uh, you know, at different points in training and, and based on skill level, I think both are essential, um, not to backtrack, but I did have one question. I know you talked about working, you kind of with your, your red, yellow, green stuff, have you found that working with younger players has really helped you with the older players you work with and the more skilled players you work with? That's a great question. In terms of being able to impact another player, I've definitely learned a ton of things from youth, kind of just know, I can see how they respond to things I say and what they actually yeah. soak in. Um, so I would say that's more towards like mental training and life stuff, but I, I can see what actually affects that the kid. And that's definitely helped me with older kids to kind of see what they'll soak in because older kids are a little more tricky with that life and mental stuff, just because, mm-hmm. you know, they're growing up, they're trying to figure out who they are. Um, right. You know, too cool for school kind of comes into play a lot of the times uh, thinking they know everything, which I remember in high school, I thought I knew everything, uh, which is very, very far from the truth. As you get older, you realize right. that there's so many things that you don't know. But I would, I would say in terms of that life training aspect, in terms of youth, I can, it's hard because you, what you do when you're really young matters so much for your game when you get older, because you're like a, like a drop, like you're saying, it's very hard for, to just pick up a high schooler and change their complete stance of muscle memory. Cause they've done it for so many right. years, same thing with the shot. So um, I would say it's hard in that aspect to that's where training is completely different. It's more high schoolers. It's more kind of you're working with what you got. It's, it's already to a point their muscle memory is kind of built the type of player they're going to be. Um, so I would kind of like the themes I'm going to work on whatever they're really good at. So if they're a three and D player, I'm going to maximize that. I'm not going to be working on stuff that they're never going to use in a game. Whereas youth players, you can kind of build them into the player uh, that you can imagine them being. And they have much more freedom in that yeah. aspect. Yeah, I completely echo everything you said. Um, yeah, I think, I mean, it's like you're, when you're in fifth grade, you don't have a role, right? When, uh-huh. when you're a senior in high school, you might have a role. So definitely something that I keep in mind, too. 
Um, I've just found that, you know, I, I know I mentioned the, the first two players I worked with, they were, they were super, super skilled. And I, I think my gauge was a little off because of yeah. that. Um, mm-hmm. And so what I've learned over time is like working with, you know, a, a, like a fourth grader on a, like you said, outside, outside layup, like what they're struggling with. I've seen, you know, high schools, high schoolers struggle with the exact same, you know, timing and rhythm, you know, with their dribble step and then into that, you know, outside, outside foot, outside hand finish. So it's like, it's crazy. I think how, you know, at first I was like, oh, you know, I just, I want to work with just the elite players. Um, but I found a ton of development in working with youth. And, and just like you said, it, it is fun being able to just kind of help shape them into the player mm-hmm. they hope to become. So, so I, that's, I find it nothing. I like, I love training high schoolers cause I can, I have way more freedom in terms of what we can train on from a basketball aspect, right. but it's much more fulfilling to me like just watching this kid grow up and you can kind of shape who they are to be a better version of themselves. Like that is just awesome to me. It's not that high schoolers aren't fulfilling to me whatsoever. It's just a different kind of, you know, feeling when you watch a kid go from third grade to a freshman in high school and you're like, dang, I've been with this kid for this long and this is what he ended up being. It's cool. Um, But yeah, Yeah. I I totally agree with that. And then that can kind of piggyback. We talked about life and mental training a little bit. And I love that you're into that stuff because not many trainers are. Um, And I really, in 20 years, dude, I feel like that's all it's going to be. It's just so hard for people to, you know, buy into mental training because it's not measurable versus shooting, right? right? If you shoot 500 shots a day, you're going to see your percentage go up because you can measure it by numbers. Whereas you can't measure, you know, the type of thoughts you're having, whether you're being, you have the feeling of confidence or not, things like that. It's hard to measure. So it's hard for people to buy into it. But I'm telling you that will be all, that's going to be the most valuable thing in 20 years in terms of sports, in my opinion. But why don't we talk a little bit about your philosophies on mental training and life coaching in terms of for your players? I mean, I think there's just so many players, uh, myself included, who are or were held back just by the mental side. Yep. Um, And so I mean, you can have all the skill in the world. Um, and, and I like when I watched, you know, I was watching NBA games last night. And it's like these these players are so elite mentally that the shots they're willing to take the like you said, the amount of the feeling of confidence that they have, you know, to take some of these shots to, to play at that level in, in front of that many eyes. But yeah, I mean, in terms of mental training, I mean, it's it's it is so broad, like you said. Um, you know, for me, I, I, I really just think it comes down to care. So, I mean, I, I try to have every individual that are they're not individual but you know every person whether it's individual session or a group session um you know know that they matter as a human being far more than they matter as a basketball player one and so i think that's um you know absolutely imperative and, and it doesn't need to be instilled through another coach um but as a player out there i mean i think you know having your soul identity wrapped into you know who you are in terms of a basketball player um is, ex- is extremely risky and so like i know for for me you know, if I played bad on Friday night, my weekend kind of sucked. You know, it's like Saturday, I'm thinking about the game. Sunday, I'm, you know, okay, we're getting in the gym. I'm working harder than I ever did because I played horrible. You know what I mean? So it's, and not to say that you can't, you know, use, um, you know, losses or, or, or bad games as, as fuel to the fire, but, you know, just knowing that, you know, you as a human being have a lot more to offer to this world than, than just uh, being able to put a ball in the hoop is, is kind of where I start uh, from, from step one. That's awesome. So you just spit gold right there in terms of um, identity, tying your identity to basketball is extremely risky, which is so, so true. And that's the biggest thing I've learned this year um, playing college basketball again is surrendering to results, not letting performances define me. Like I, I was just like you, I'd be so down if I didn't play well. And then if I played really well, um, I'd be on a high. Right. And that's so, that's a very, very risky and hard way to live because it's just going to be such a roller coaster where if you surrender to a result and you you realize that everything's in your best interest like there's nothing you can do other than trying to become the best version of yourself and everything else that happens to you it's going to make you better right even if it's the worst thing in the world um, knowing that you're going to get through it and improve upon it I think is huge and like you said basketball is a means to an end it's going to end for absolutely everybody whether parents don't like it or coaches don't like it or people that are completely consumed by basketball don't like it, it's going to end, right? So it's the things that you take away when basketball is gone. And I think that's the biggest thing for me. I always used to ask myself, like I legit would work out four hours a day or four workouts a day in high school. Like all I did was basketball. 
And I would ask myself, like, is this going to pay off mm-hmm. for me? Because I wanted to go to the NBA. I wanted to go overseas um, and play professionally. I was like, if that doesn't happen, you know, is this paying off for me? And it paid off for me in so many ways other than just the sport. And that's why my, that's literally the focus of my business is making other people better outside of basketball. And that's why I think parents see the value in that. And I think that's why we've grown so much. Um, But I think that's absolutely awesome that you said, don't tie your identity to basketball. I think that's great. And and it's just like you said, right? So, you know, your goal was to maybe get overseas or play in the NBA. And for me, I wanted to play in college, you know, Mm -hmm. or or I wanted to at least, you know, looking back, I wanted to have, you know, an amazing high school season, you know, my senior year, be an amazing high school player. And, you know, did I, did I amount to that? You know, not really. I, I you know, looking back, I would say I was, you know, average or, or slightly above average. Um, and so, you know, although we maybe didn't hit our goals or hit our, you know, results-based um, kind of thinking, like you were saying, um, I think, you know, that work ethic that we both had is, is helping us, you know, far more than we even realize. I mean, I, I know, you know, for me, like today, I, I had, you know, a 6.30 a.m. session, 7.30 a.m. session uh, this morning. And it's like, you know, if I wasn't having, you know, 5.30 practices in high school, like, you know, would I have the drive to get up and work with this player? Like, probably not, you yep. know, just being fully honest. And so um, I think that's, you know, important for all the listeners just to to realize that, you know, whether or not you, you, you know, accomplish what you're set out to accomplish. I mean, I think it's going to, going to help you in, in ways, you know, that maybe you don't realize tomorrow or, or even a year from now, but um, you know, in, in hindsight, you, you definitely um, can reap the rewards. Yeah. That's awesome. You have a very similar mentality to me, I would say. Um, yeah. And then the last thing on the document that I see is personal growth and development. So it kind of ties into that. Um, but did you kind of elaborate what you wanted to talk about in this section? Yeah, I mean, and part of it, part of it's just piggybacking off of, off of what you said. I mean, I, I think now it's like, OK, I, I, you know, I didn't want my soul identity to be a basketball player. Mm-hmm. And now it's like, you know, I don't want my soul identity to be a basketball trainer. I mean, it it is, you know, for both of us, such a huge part of our life. Um, you know, we have, you know, all the players we work with. You know, we now have um, other trainers that are that are working um, you know, with us. And so it's, it's definitely a lot to manage trying to impact, you know, you know, ways, you know, farther than farther than the game, just like you stated, but, but yeah, I, I love, I love what you said about, you know, how kind of everything is in your best interest and, and an opportunity to learn and grow. And I know that's a, a great quote from, from, I think a, a book that we probably both read. I was going to say that's in a lot of the Lucas Jaden and yeah. Joshua Metcalf books. Yeah, I can't, uh, definitely can't credit those guys enough in terms of just kind of shaping my my mental perspective but but yeah I mean it's constant it's it's never like you've arrived I mean me- mental training and 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 just overall life skills they're, they they never stop and so um yeah just looking to continue to grow and and you know whether it's you know good or bad I mean there's I'm, I'm sure you've had a a ton of obstacles you know throughout throughout your years and mm-hmm. um it's just you know handling them as they come and and, and learning as much as you can so that, yeah. that's kind of where I am that's awesome. What would you say the, the number one way you learn right now is like, do you watch videos? Is it social media? Is it reading? What do you think grows you the most? I do. I do read a lot and I love, like, I awesome. love all the, the trying to be clutch books. Um, but, but truthfully, I mean, I, I think it's, I think it's more so from the interactions I have um, and, and whether that's, you know, reaching out to other trainers or other people who, you know, maybe our other entrepreneurs running their own business. I mean, at the end of the day, we're, we're kind of entrepreneurs and, you know, you know, kind of blazing our own trail, if, if, if you would. So I think just having those interactions and then even from like just a basketball training perspective, like I've learned so much from from the kids that that, that I work with. Um, just to give you like a great example, one of the trainers um, who's working with me right now, his name is Emmanuel Obi. He played uh, two years overseas in England. And so like, you know, he would come to me, um, you know, prior, prior to, 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 you know, being on staff, um, you know, we would constantly get workouts in and like, it was almost like the conversation, like, you know, like he mm-hmm. do something hey, like, did that, like, what did that feel like? Help me out. Like, you know, and he, he's asking me things. I'm asking him things. We're both just learning on the fly. And, and, you know, it was very early on that, you know, we could tell we, we shared the, the same love for the game and the same love for just overall development, both on and off the court. So, yeah, I, I think, books might be a close second to the to the conversations but yeah, yeah. no I would say for you? I would say I'm a big reader I've learned over time that I enjoy stories about people and what they've learned from their life um because it's kind of like a it's a preface it kind of uh 
gets you to understand what you're going to be facing and can help prepare you for it. But I would totally agree. People is probably the best way to learn and not talk about relationships, but in terms I've learned over time, like I was used to think like, I want to marry someone exactly like me. Um, (laughs) And over time I've realized like, that's not, that's why opposites attract is because you can learn if someone's obviously you have to have the same core values, but you can learn from your partner if they have skills that they're really good at. And then you're not good at, right? So then that person improves you. Whereas if you're the same person, right, you're not really taking away anything from that experience. But I think that's an awesome example, kind of what you were talking about, is that you learn from people and experiences to better yourself. But I'm a firm believer that we can learn from everybody. Um, I remember growing up, like, it's all about age, right? If they're the same age as me, right, I can't learn from them. But if they're older than me, right, they they have authority and I can learn from them. Um, Even now, like, I watch my kids do things, like little kids, like I was doing a speech in front of the school, this school one time. And I was with a bunch of fourth graders and I was asking them to raise their hand for something. And none of them would do that. And I asked them all, right. I I was like, if you were in kindergarten, do you think all of you would be raising your hand right now? And they, they all shook their head and they go, yes. And I said, so see, this is a great example of how you can learn from everybody. When you're so young, you don't even have anxiety or fear about anything. And so that just means fear is energy, right? It's all makeup in your own head. Um, which is preventing you from raising your hand as you get older. Uh, But I think that's, that's awesome because you, you truly can learn from absolutely anybody, whether they're 20 years younger than you or 20 years older than you or the same age, right? It it really doesn't matter. Everyone has their uniqueness about themselves and can better yourself in learning. So I think that was an awesome point. Yeah, no, I I love love the example you gave. It it reminds me kind of, 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 you know, there's, I've been doing a lot of research on just like, like, you know, coping with anxiety. And I know every, you know, mm-hmm. like basketball training in terms of mental training, a lot of people have performance anxiety. And then, you know, also off the court, there's, um, you know, a ton of various anxieties that people deal with as well. And, and just like you were saying, like the, the fear to raise your hand, um, you know, most fear. And like, for me, I think about, you know, there were times when I passed up a lot of open, open looks. So mm-hmm. like, for me, I was, I was just worried, you know, it's usually a, a combination or it's usually one of the two or a combination of both, you know, that fear of failure or, or the fear of judgment. And so, and that's one thing I, I like to bring up to to a lot of players and, um, you know, just helping them through that, like, you know, kind of that little voice in, in, in the back of your head saying, like, you know, what, you know, what if I airball, what if I miss, uh-huh. like, you know, and, and I used to think, like, I was the only one thinking those, or, you, you know, you're probably in class, you know, thinking about raising your hand, and you're like, oh, you know, maybe I don't want to, but, you know, realistically, there's probably, you know, 20 people thinking the exact same thing, and yep. and even, you know, relating that to, to basketball, like, even, even the NBA guys are, are going through the same thing. Like, you know, the fact that, you know, we think that they don't feel nerves or that they don't mm-hmm. feel, you know, various pressures is, is, is just inhumane more, more or less. So, so I love, I love that point as well. That is an awesome point. And I think that's one thing I've learned is like, I, I always used to look up to people that were older than me or writing books and like, dang, these guys got it figured out. And at the end of the day, once you realize that nobody has it figured out, um, right. that's, what's going to propel you over fear and anxiety because like everybody has it, everybody has those thoughts, the people that you, that are your idols and household names and things of that nature, they just decided to do it, even though in spite of that feeling, and and it doesn't mean they still don't get the feeling like you said, like NBA players, we look at them and they're like, these guys just, they have ultimate confidence, they have no self doubt. And they do, they just decide to not let it stop them from doing something. Um, So I think that is an awesome point, because nobody, nobody has it figured out, we all have anxiety, and we all have fear. Yeah, no doubt. I mean, just like full transparency, like one of my biggest fears was like, okay, I didn't play college basketball. Why in the world is a college basketball player going to want to come to me? Mm-hmm. And, you know, you work with one of them and you realize, okay, like, you know, you're, you're providing value and you're learning from them and they're learning from you. And they're pretty like, and now it's like, I love working with college guys. I, you know, I want to, I want to work with, you know, and I've worked with a couple, you know, overseas players and things like that. And it's, you know, I, I don't, I mean, it's not that you don't have any anxiety. I mean, it's, it's just, it's, it's much less. And so, yeah, I think, I think that's awesome stuff and just willing to take a risk and, and willing to, you know, fall flat on your face. Um, you know, that, that's how, that's how you're going to learn. So that, that is an awesome point. Cause that's something I haven't thought of. Um, but yeah, if you're, if you provide good value, it really does not matter what your background is. If you're helping this player do whatever they're paying you to do, right. You're going to be just fine which I think is a great point. This has been a great conversation. Is there anything you kind of wanted to add that we didn't go over or ask me any other questions that I didn't ask you? Not a ton. I mean, I guess I know like the, the off season and the, the summer swing of things are, are kind of on the horizon. What, like, what, uh, what do you have going in the, in the near future and, and this summer? 
So we do a 3v3 camp every year in the summer. Um, nice, I saw that. And the reason for that is because that's the best way for us to maximize players per hour. So we can get eight players in one hour that way. Um, and we still do training on the side. Right. But we've been doing it for five or six years. And every year, parents and kids just absolutely love the thing because you get half skills and half games. Um, that's perfect. Yeah, exactly. That's so, ask you. Yeah. So they're learning and they're having a ton of fun at the same time. So it's like the best of both worlds. Um, but this year has been a little more stressful because we have a lot more kids. So it, it gets a little lot organizing things, but I'm super excited just because I haven't trained in nine months. Um, I, all, all the people that have been training for close the gate have been doing it for me. I'm super excited to be back and just with the kids. Yeah. yeah. That's a lot, to, a lot to look forward to, but, but yeah, definitely. I, I totally can relate to the, it's hard. The scheduling, the scheduling aspect can, can be tedious as well. And that's yes. one thing that nobody kind of sees behind the scenes, but, but no, that's, that's awesome. And, and best of luck with that. That sounds great. So do you plan on just doing more training basically throughout the day? Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, very similar to kind of, like you said, the, the three on three aspect, um, mm -hmm. I'm like, I've started some youth group sessions going right now. Um, and really going to try to just do that at every level. So just kind of get a college group where, you know, I think, like you said, we'll cap it at eight. Um, where we can get, you know, four on each side of the gym and, yep. you know, half skills and then, you know, half probably some small sided games and then some, some, you know, three on three or four on four. Um, so really looking to do that at every age level. Um, but yeah, adding on um, the, the two trainers that I, that I mentioned, um, you know, yeah. now allows us to, to have sessions on both ends of the gym. So that's great. Um, we just uh, resurfaced the floor of last weekend. So Ooh. the traction, yeah, the traction is really, has really gone up that was a that was a uh, a good learning experience standing and resurfacing a floor that I had no idea what goes into that but that that was cool um so yeah Jim's in a little bit of better condition and and just excited to to get more individual and group sessions going and um yeah hopefully gonna do some camps as well so excited for that that's awesome and I think I saw your story about that where you're squeaking your shoes <laughs> yeah 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 that was neat cool. I mean I was constantly, we would buy those like Dick's sticky mats, like crazy. I mean, it's an old yeah. church gym. Yeah. So the, it was, I mean, it's just, you don't want to see players slip and, you know, I, did, I was worried, you know, somebody's going to get injured more or less. And so um, luckily had some, had a, had a guy help out uh, from a flooring company and he, he knew exactly what to do, gave us the supplies and, and uh, we went from there. So that's awesome. That is awesome, Trent. Well, thank you so much for being on off the court. We're definitely gonna have to do this again because we are very similar in our beliefs, which is kind of cool. I'll let you know when this podcast gets edited and I don't know when it'll be posted. It'll probably be in a few weeks, um, but I'll let you know when that happens. And then we can stay in touch because you're in Madison. So I'm sure we'll meet up at some point soon. Yeah, no, definitely. Definitely would, would absolutely love to. And yeah, appreciate you for having me on and, and more or less just connecting. I mean, I, I think it's awesome where, you know, and not that age matters at all, but we're, we're similar age and going yep. through similar things. And what I've found is like, there's not a lot of people doing what we do. So it, it's great to yes. connect and, and learn from each other and be able to bounce, uh, bounce good and bad off. off each yes. Other, so. That's awesome. All right. So thank you so much, Trent. And then um, we'll stay in touch. Sound good. Perfect. Sounds awesome. great. Hopefully my audio was good. Yes, it was. All Peace right, out, great. Trent. Okay. Yes. Appreciate it. Have a great rest of your day. You too. Thank you guys so much for listening to this episode of Off the Court. If you're listening to this on Apple Podcasts, please don't forget to leave reviews if you haven't yet. This helps us with engagement and helps us rank higher to make an influence on more basketball lives. I also strongly encourage you guys to check out our free ebook download that's 25 pages long, How to Unlock the Mental Side of the Game. I was a player that was constantly grinding and constantly working, and it was really hard for me not to see results from the amount of work I was putting in. But this ebook that I wrote dives exactly into those types of questions. I was completely ignoring the most important part of basketball, which is the mental side of the game. So the 25 page ebook that I wrote is for you guys to give yourselves a leg up on your competition and almost like a secret weapon. I call it the basketball cheat code. Also check out our website, ctghoops.com. On there, we got tons of programs that you guys can download to make yourselves a better basketball player. We have the CTG productivity notebook, helping you guys become addicted to productivity. Of course, in-person training, 
we are located now in multiple cities. And then we have the CTG blog, free education on becoming your best basketball self. Lastly, follow all our social media pages at CTG Hoops, where we post multiple times a day, trying to make you the best player and person that you can be. All the links for these are down in the description below. Thank you guys so much. Make sure you guys check out all the other episodes of Off the Court and make sure you're ready for next week's episode. I'm Coach Jack. We out, baby. Peace.